spirit and truth. That's what's great about our services is we have the word, but we also have the spirit and we can worship the spirit. So, um, past few weeks I've been kind of preachy, cheechy, treachy. Uh, I'm going to go back to my old intellectual type lesson for today. Um, want to do the, do the book of Romans. Anybody that's following along with us, we've finished the book of Romans in the, in the New Testament readings, and uh, it's very inspiring. So start off tonight. We'll see how it goes over the, over the summer weeks. Praise the Lord. All right, so kind of uh, dry material, but I'm trying to look for some things that are interesting to us, things that didn't know, didn't see it that way. Um, so we'll do an introduction tonight. Um, start with the, the author of the book of Romans was Paul, and he was formerly Saul, and I found something interesting. In Acts 13, 9, it said, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. So he's about to do a miracle and so on. This is Acts chapter 13. Back in Acts chapter 8 is the first time we're introduced to Saul, and I look from chapter 8 through chapter 13, he was called Saul every single time, which I found interesting. So that was, I was getting worried as to where did his name change to, to Paul? And this is the first place I found that uh, he was from then on called Paul. Um, and there's something else that's a little bit interesting about that too. Maybe it has nothing to do with it, but we'll, we'll see. Now, um, Saul kind of neat that he, he did change his name because we all changed our name to Jesus and we were baptized into his name um, Paul changed his name or Saul was called Paul afterwards uh, but as Saul he uh, at eight, Acts 8 3 as for Saul he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison and uh, he was an enemy of the church in his zeal for Judaism. And Jesus actually intervened. Now, I think even last week I mentioned that the church is to do this passing of the gospel to people, not God. That was the whole theme the last week. If, not, if, if we don't do it, do we expect God to do it? This is one of those exceptions. God intervened on uh, Saul's behalf. And it's recorded here, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Interesting. Look up the word must, and, and you'll see a number of places where it says must. Must isn't a choice. It isn't a voluntary thing. It's a must. You got to. And again, here with salvation, Paul was told, this is what you must do. Now, Jesus didn't tell him how to be saved. He didn't tell him what to do. He said, go to a man who's in my church, a disciple named Ananias. And Ananias told him, baptized him. Paul got the Holy Ghost. He was able to see again, and he immediately went out preaching Jesus, and, and so on. So, now we have Paul, the one that we, you know, we're, we're wrote the book of Romans, and so on. Uh, some interesting things about Saul. Uh, all, all that we probably know, I just gathered them together in this few slides. Uh, he was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, and I don't think there's a country called Cilicia anymore, so uh, Tarsus is up in Syria, I think. Uh, Acts 22, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Sicilia, Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as you are all this day. Acts 22 is he's already converted. But he's recognizing that the people he's talking to are zealous toward God, as he was zealous toward God. Uh, he was taught by this man, Gamaliel, 
Uh, and we first heard of him, just to bring it to your remembrance, in Acts chapter 5. They had just taken in the, uh, a couple of the apostles, Peter and John, because they did a miracle of the man sitting at the gate. And the man went in, and they captured him, they brought him in, and they were going to punish them and put, you know, get them in prison, maybe kill them, I don't know. Uh, they sit and debated. And then he's this Gamel, 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 Leo. <laughs> uh, he stood up, and the council, a Pharisee, and a doctor of the law had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. So he said, okay, let's get them out while we talk about this. And what he had said to them, look, if it's of God, you don't want to be against them. If it's not of God, it'll fail. But don't, don't find yourself on the, uh, doing something you don't have to do. And so they, what do they do? They immediately whip them and then let them go. They, so they still punished them and told them not to speak in that name. And immediately the next morning they preached. So uh, this is who taught Saul. Uh, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was zealous toward God, but he hadn't understood God's plan. And this just reminds me of a couple of people. There's probably many more that you can think of. But Jacob was the younger son of Isaac and uh, Esau. And Jacob's concern, he had zeal for the blessings and the promise of his father Abraham and of God. And Esau was more concerned of earthly things. So it reminds me of that kind of zeal. As a matter of fact, none of us are clean. So whether we're far into sin or small into sin, we are, we are saved. So it's not saved by how much sin we did at all. It's our zeal towards God. That's what got us, our zeal towards God. And uh, another example would be Cornelius uh, uh, in, in Italy, uh, I believe. And he gave and prayed to God always. He was always at the Jewish temple. So he had a lot of zeal, and God answered that zeal. Again, not by telling him what to do, but by telling him to go see uh, Peter. So zeal is important. But like we are spirit and truth, we're not the, the spirit church, we're the spirit and truth church. Because we have to have the zeal, the spirit, to, to worship God, but we also have to worship him in truth. Saul had the zeal, but he didn't have the truth until he, he met Jesus along the way. Um, he was a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching a law, a Pharisee. So he was a Pharisee. Remember, Pharisees believed in uh, uh, resurrection. They believed in angels. The Sadducees were more earth-like, didn't believe in anything that way. Uh, so he was of that. Uh, he, he used that in one story, I just remind you of... Uh, that he was in trouble, they were accusing him, and then the wisdom of God came to him and he said, I'm a Pharisee, I believe in resurrection. Well, they had Sadducees and Pharisees in the room and they became a big storm as to Pharisees versus, and uh, he, he later got out of that, that trouble that he was in. I give that to uh, a word of wisdom from the Lord to say that. Uh, I wonder if we could ever use that sometime. <laughs> we were in trouble, we could bring up something else that gets people riled up. Uh, this was the other thing that I wanted to say is uh, just notice that he was of the tribe of Benjamin and there was a Saul that was also of the tribe of Benjamin, the first king of Israel so maybe he didn't want to be called Saul of Benjamin because the first Saul of Benjamin failed as a king of, of uh, back, back then of the, the Jewish nation Paul was a tent maker that was uh, very interesting that he had a job. He wasn't just the high and mighty apostle who went around preaching and doing miracles and writing, but he actually had a job and he had to support himself. Uh, Acts 18.1, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So he actually had a job on the Humdian 
beyond being that. Remember, Peter is a fisherman, and he went back to fishing, uh, probably not after the church was formed, but uh, these are people like you and I, have, a, have a, a job, and they had to keep doing the job to make money and so on. Later on, we read in the, uh, in the uh, letters, not to muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. In other words, if he takes an offering and he uses it for his, that means he doesn't have to do tents. And if he doesn't have to do tents, he has more time for the church and God's business. So um, he was also a miracle worker, many miracles. Acts 19.11, God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul. Next, uh, Paul was an apostle. Remember what the word apostle means? It's one who's sent. And he states this, and I didn't go in all the other places to prove this. He just states it in the first verse of Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Uh, so he, he is an apostle. He is one that God has sent. Uh, in particular, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, Acts 11.13, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. Just wanted to bring something to your attention also. is uh, interesting that Peter was an unlearned, coarse Jew. And he became the apostle to the Jews. And then you have the very learned Jew, and he ended up becoming the apostle to the Gentile. It's funny how God works those things. And we, yeah, we, we, can, we can learn from that. We can see it happen in our day. So-and-so became this, and so-and-so married that, and it's like, wow, that's not what I thought. God's ways are different than our ways. And uh, both, both were humble because of these different jobs, but they recognized it, uh, what they had to do. So uh, Paul was also a Roman citizen, and that comes into effect uh, with respect to Rome. Uh, then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief an captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was freeborn. So it kind of tells us that Paul's parents were Roman citizens. Mm -hmm. So he was born, born a Roman. Even the soldier, chief captain, had to buy his citizenship. I don't know how that works, but uh, to be a Roman, uh, people who weren't had to buy into it. Um, So, interesting, this, this Paul in Rome, we're seeing little ties uh, happening here. Uh, he met Aquila, and Aquila had come from Rome. And uh, Jesus actually told him that he would bear witness in Rome in Acts 23. And in the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. And going back in the book of Acts to chapter 19, we see that Paul had wanted to see Rome. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Acacia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he had said that four chapters, and I don't know how many years or, or what, uh, before the Lord said, I'm going to send you to Rome. So be careful what you wish for. <laughs> It may come later. And of course, when he went to Rome, it wasn't on a vacation to tour Rome. He was a prisoner on a ship that shipwrecked and he ended up in Rome. So uh, it's just, you know, interesting things, how, how things work out. Um, Paul wrote the book of Romans from Corinth before he ever went to Rome. He hadn't been to Rome, but he had written this book to Rome. It's going to be interesting as we go through the, through the book. Um, a point to, you know, just say, well, how do you know that? Uh, uh, here's one point. There's, there's many. He baptized a man named Gaius in 1 Corinthians 1. And then in Romans 16, when he was saluting everybody, he said, and, and said, Gaius was my host. So he was in Corinth. He was at Gaius, Gaius's house, whom he had baptized. And he was writing to, to Rome interesting you have to you have to find these things to, to put things together but you can learn a lot as we did about the, the other apostles uh, we can learn about a lot about somebody from little tidbits here and there 
Paul wrote this letter in approximately 58, 59 AD, kind of an earlier book, but not one of the first. Many of the other letters were written before this letter. Uh, I'd like, just, just listen to this. It's kind of almost poetic. The book was inspired by God, authored by Paul, written by Tertius, and delivered by Phoebe. Okay? The, the letter went through uh, this, this chain, chain of command, if you would. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So the inspired by God, the scriptures. Uh, however, Paul was the one who dictated it to Tertius. Uh, Romans 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, saying, I am the one speaking here. And then he says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, first I, and now he uses I, so he's, he's really writing a letter from him to them. So that's, we know it's authored by Paul. There isn't any doubt of that. Um, the scholars have, have completely are positive. Uh, then, even though he didn't write it himself, he had a man named Tertius write it, which is interesting. Uh, in Romans 16, the end of the chapter, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. A whole bunch of salutations. And that, all those salutations in the last chapter of Romans gets my curiosity. Who are all these people? What did they do in their lives? And maybe, maybe we know something about them. I don't know. But it sure makes it real. When you see so many people, this house and that person, and, and they knew the, each other. It wasn't just the apostle to an unknown group of church members. It was real people. Interesting. Um, and then delivered by Phoebe, 16.1, uh, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, was at, which is at uh, St. Crea. So they had a lot of churches other than just a church in Corinth. Oh, maybe a lot of little towns had churches. And very interesting that women are elevated to, they're a saint, like a man. And she's the one who's delivering it to Rome, carrying the Holy Scripture to Rome with this letter. Uh, and she did many works. Uh, I think there's a little bit more about Phoebe. So she was an important uh, lady of the church. And uh, good, good to see that. Um, now, neither Paul or Peter started the Church of Rome. And there are people and scholars that want to force this point. They want to force Peter to be Peter the first pope, and then, you know, they just try and try and squeeze that square peg in a round hole. Uh, and uh, Paul didn't start the church because he was writing to the church before he ever was there. I think probably Priscilla and Aquila evangelized in Italy. Um, Verse 18, two, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came unto them. So he was Aquila and his wife Priscilla, and he always mentions Priscilla with Aquila. Uh, they were very strong, very big at traveling and going to, to churches and starting churches, big evangelists. They are the ones that explain to Apollos the complete doctrine. And then Paul went and found some of Apollos' converts who hadn't known the complete doctrine, and he explained to them the complete. So Paul and Priscilla and Aquila knew the complete doctrine, and we see Paulus, who was mighty, and mighty at convincing the Jews, he learned the true doctrine from uh, Aquila and Priscilla. So a lot of, a lot of history here, a lot of passing of, of people. Figuring... You know, it's a big, big countries of, of ocean, the, the Mediterranean Sea, the islands, millions of people, no doubt, and yet these people cross paths, and it's you know, it's it's God's little network, hopefully a big network. So, uh, so they came from Rome, so they had been in Rome. That's why I'm thinking that while they were the evangelists, that they really helped. But going even back further. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, when they first spoke in tongues and they brought out all the people, the thousands of people that wanted to say, what is this? It said, uh, for, and I can't read these, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya and about Serene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, were there. So when they left Jerusalem to go back to their home, 
they had been there at the day of Pentecost. Maybe they received the Holy Ghost. Maybe they went back and, and uh, started the Ju Jesus religion, maybe not knowing everything. Uh, but Priscilla and Aquila went there, and they, we know they knew everything. So the Church of Rome got started uh, these possible ways. So the main themes of the book, I wanted to do more on this, but I will after I really get down and study the, the actual uh, chapters. But from reading it one time through and reading commentary, uh, the main themes were that uh, the Jews, the, ch the church in Rome had Jews and it had converted heathens or converted Gentiles, uh, Greek and Italian. And so they were, and they were together in the church, and the Jews wanted the Gentiles to follow the law and get circumcised and all of that. We see that in Galatia, we see that in Hebrews, uh, always wanting to go back to the law. So uh, Paul had to write to this mixed congregation, mm -hmm. and I've been in a mixed congregation. We had three different nationalities, uh, two of which fought. Another was far, a far nationality. It was, and the, our pastor had to had to pastor that whole group, and they had different ideas because they came from different countries. It was an interesting time in Boston, but um, this is what he's talking to, and the the uh, the scholars that I've ri read looking at this are amazed at how he crafted the letter. That it was so well done, not to offend them too much, not to offend how he brought them together, even though he had to correct them. You're wrong because of this, you're wrong, but we are, and he brought them together. So it's a, it's a beautifully crafted book. Uh, they speculate about how, how much time he must have spent putting this together. And, re and also, I can just tell you now, we'll, we'll get to it, but there'll be sentences that he'll say a sentence within a sentence to clarify something, and then he gets back to the same point. So it's, it's very well crafted, uh, trying to uh, meet the needs of, of both groups. Um, so the Jews had the law, but they failed it, and they missed the Messiah. The Greeks and the barbarians didn't have the law, and when they believed in Jesus, they didn't need the law to justify them, which the Jews were trying to have them do. The Jews couldn't boast in their law, and the giant Gentiles couldn't boast in their accomplishment. You know, Rome, we own the world. We have... Uh, modern technology, aqueducts, highways going around the world, Europe, and, and so on. They couldn't boast in that because that doesn't save them, and the Jews couldn't boast that we have the law. Um, at, the, at the end, I'll, I'll just try to sum that up a little bit. But the conclusion was Romans 3.22, I pulled, and 23, which we've read and used many times, and so do other Christians of partial faith, uh, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we tend to use this scripture, I have always used this scripture, uh, to prove that even good people, not shaved, have sinned. Even, we, we try and say, look, everybody, you know, everybody sinned, no matter how good a person you are and so on. But Paul was using it as a conclusion that Jews... Or Gentiles, we've all we've all sinned. So knowing the book now gives me a better meaning of what that. So I'm not pulling the one scripture out to mean what I want it to mean. In this case here, he was saying, "You Jews and your Gentiles that are fighting about who should do what and who's higher than, in, in the kingdom and so on, uh, you've all sinned and come short, both sides." Um, so I, th I thought that was interesting, and I, I pulled out that scripture before we ever get to chapter three. So in chapters 1 through 5, and I noticed this before I read it in the scholars. Oh, that made me feel good. Here I open this book of a professor. I guess it's huge books. And he said it too. Chapters 1 through 5 is the argument that he makes, Paul makes. Uh, he crafted the books of Jews and heathen Christians, uh, Gentiles, which corrected them both and connected them through justification by faith. Then... In 6 through 8, and even all the way to the end of the book, he speaks to the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, sometimes separately. Um, but the thing that I had brought it, that division at chapter 5 was, 1 through 5 
is this argument about the Jews' justification by works is no longer valid. We now have Jesus Christ and your belief in him. And uh, when he goes into 6, he talks about their salvation and their salvation process. That 6 starts right with, we're buried with him in baptism. Up until then, we don't have baptism. We have works versus heathenism and works didn't work and Jesus came and instituted a new way to be justified. So people stop at five and make a weak doctrine out of chapters one through five and they don't read the rest of the book. It's, they, they just get that. So um, I'll, I'll go back to that one more time. I, I want to emphasize that, but let's stay with the thing. Um, the attitudes of the day were that the Jews had utter aversion to heathens. They, they had utter aversions to Samaritans who were half Jews, but they really thought the rest of the heathens were a little better than the animals, but they're just animals also. They're not God's people. Uh, the heathens thought the Jews were full of crazy superstitions and folly, and even they drink blood and they kill babies, and you know they had all kinds of rumors. As Claudius sent them all out of Rome just at this time. They've always been sent out, and like out of Europe and out of Russia and so on. So you had these two people that didn't mix, and yet God was mixing them in the church. Um, so, just to ask a couple questions. Why is the book of Romans the first of the letters in the Bible? Okay, we might think that it was the first book written, but it isn't. They wrote other books before that. Um, but Rome was the center of the known uh, world at the time, and that's why they put that book as the first one. And then look at the second one. The second one is Corinthians. That was the known center for the Greek world, which was the other kind of, uh, not military leadership, but the, the educational, the philosophical, and so on. So those are the reasons why, if they, I didn't, maybe nobody ever asked that question, why, is, why are they ordered this way? It's not alphabetical, and it's not by time, but it was by um, uh, the... the yeah, the, the 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 height of the audience or something in that in that time. If you look, Peter, uh, the individual letters are are also interesting. I think Peter comes before John, John one two three, Peter one and two. Uh, so they were ordering the books. Whoever whoever ordered it, that kind of thing. They thought Peter was the you know head apostle, so they had his book first means nothing other than if you're interested as to why they put it that way. Okay, um, what language was the book of Romans written? So it's been postulated in Hebrew, in Syriac, in Latin, or in Greek. Um, it's pretty much understood that it was written in Greek. I'll tell you, the ones who think it was written in Hebrew, Hebrew was only used in Judea, not outside, so they would have to send it to them and then transcribe it and so on. Um, Latin is only used in Italy, so it's not for the whole place. It would only be for, read it in Italy. Syriac, the only way they thought Syriac was possible is that Paul dictated it in Syriac and Tertius changed it to Greek. Again, just a theory. I don't think it's believed by anybody. Um, whereas Greek was written and it was read in most of the known world. Jesus knew Greek. The people of the land knew Greek. They may have had their own local dialect like Hebrew or, or Latin or whatever, but the whole world did speak Greek at the time, so most likely is written in Greek. And then you got to get to the Septuagint and the Greek version of the Bible when they put it together. And did they actually have the Greek or was it translated into Greek? It certainly was translated into Latin, but why would he have written it in Latin? It doesn't make sense. Um, so in summary for tonight, and it's hot in here, so you'd be glad I'm summarizing. Uh, if one was to listen in on an argument or a debate, uh, let's say you walk into a courtroom and you listen to one question or so, you're not going to get the whole story. Uh, one would not be wise to take one sentence or one point of that contention alone in forming a doctrine. Mm -hmm. And some people have stopped at chapter 5 and formed a kind of watered-down doctrine 
when in fact the whole book ties it in the harmony with the rest of Scripture. So if you, if you only take a piece of the Bible, you may get just an argument, and this in case here was a Paul talking to certain Jews and Gentiles trying to get along in the church and explaining to them. But that, we don't make a doctrine out of that. We make a doctrine out of the whole. And when you take the whole of the book of Romans, fits right in with Acts, fits right into what Jesus taught and what Paul and what Peter taught. So we'll leave it at that and we'll, we'll Lord willing, next time uh, we'll start with chapter one. I will try uh, not to go in too much detail, but you know, point out things that, that are, are interesting that maybe we've read through and, and uh, didn't know why they were writing those things. So praise the Lord. Thank you. So uh, one thing, and I know Brother Van Allen's going to go in chapter one, but one thing in my study the last few days in Romans, actually, um, and Brother Kendall's going to bring it up, but, you know, he's talk, Brother Van Allen's talking about not making a doctrine, and rightly so. Romans, to me, kind of has a little bit of everything, you know, so maybe that's why, who knows, the Lord added that first two, where it has a little bit of what Hebrews has, has a little bit of Corinthians, and some things, but one thing I wanted to... Uh, no is in Romans 1 7 to all that be in Rome beloved of God called to be saints grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ you know originally written in the Greek translated into English if you look at there's some apostolic theologians that have pointed this out in my studies that the word the was added for our English like if you are a grammar expert in uh, you know, sometimes you'll say, put the word the, do this, don't do that, you know, uh, or Dr. Google, and they say, so if you were to take the word the out, because they, 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 two points here, they form that, that means there's two people, Father, and then the Son, Jesus Christ. Well, the first point is, well, where's the Holy Ghost? So they kind of mess that doctrine up. Second point is, if you take the word the out, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. So when the Apostle Paul was writing, he was not distinguishing, he was distinguishing some things, but he was not separating, rather, people. So amazing stuff to learn on Romans. Hopefully you were going to do that next week, but I, I took it from you. <laughs> You're dismissed. We'll see you Sunday. God bless. Yeah. yeah.